Dean. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, Dr. Safa. Uh, dear professors and colleagues, we are honored now in the presence of Professor uh, Tom, uh, Tom uh, Jekska, a professor of surgery of Harvard Medical School and uh, Vice Chairman of Pediatric General Surgery of Boston Children's Hospital. He is the Surgical Director of the Center of Advanced Steiner Rehabilitation. Uh, Professor Tom, we are uh, welcome uh, you today with our, in our neonatology conference, and we are uh, pl uh, pleasant to, to see you uh, sharing our, your experience with us. Uh, you can start. Hello and welcome to our conference. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, and uh, I guess it's a good afternoon to you. Uh, it's good morning to me. So uh, uh, I try to share my screen if I may. So uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. So, yes. so what uh, we would like to do it, it today is just to uh, discuss uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. And the title of my talk is Quantifying the Clinical Outcomes of Necrotizing Enterocolitis. I have no disclosures. Uh, the objectives of the talk are to define challenges regarding data acquisition and interpretation in neonatal surgery and uh, uh, discuss with you the uh, Vermont-Oxford uh, network uh, uh, surgical collaboration that uh, uh, has been ongoing for uh, over 15 years now. And uh, I try to give you the big picture, the overview of necrotizing enterocolitis and then uh, present a series of related studies, which hopefully will uh, allow us to uh, 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 learn a little bit uh, about necrotizing enterocolitis and also form the basis of discussion. So uh, uh, I obtained my PhD at uh, MIT, and uh, uh, it's a very quantitative place. And one of the heroes of MIT was uh, uh, Sir William Thompson, better known as Lord Kelvin, and of course Lord Kelvin defined absolute zero. But uh, another thing that he was very involved with was the building of uh, precision measurement uh, uh, instruments. And uh, what he said is if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And of course that has been uh, metamorphosed by the by Demling and the business uh, community into quality improvement, but it is very true. Uh, unfortunately, in neonatal surgery, we have a marked uh, paucity of quantitative data. It's very hard to acquire it. Uh, this is uh, Sir William Ladd, Sir William Ladd, uh, uh, sorry, this is William Ladd, not Sir. Uh, he was our first uh, 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 chief of pediatric surgery at Boston Children's Hospital and really the father of pediatric surgery in North America. And uh, from his time on, uh, we've had uh, uh, difficulties in neonatal surgery because we can't see the forest for the trees. We see the case in front of us, but it's very hard for us to uh, truly grasp uh, uh, the larger picture. And uh, all of us live in a tyranny of small numbers. Uh, uh, even in a place like Boston Children's Hospital, the average pediatric surgeon may only handle uh, uh, half a dozen to a dozen uh, necrotizing enterocolitis cases per year. So it's hard to draw broader conclusions. The other thing that we have in pediatric surgery is uh, what I call the consortium or registry trap. And uh, uh, often when we create consortiums or uh, registries, we get uh, only the most interested and uh, uh, perhaps the most motivated centers, so the data are not generalizable. If we take a look at the hierarchy of studies, uh, the most uh, uh, um, at, at the pinnacle of uh, uh, this triangle is a randomized controlled trial. 
Uh, and below it is really a cohort trial. And uh, if you think of what a randomized control trial is, it's actually just a prospective cohort trial where many of the variables have been controlled. And a randomized control trial can give you a uh, uh, answer for a very specific question, while a cohort uh, trial, particularly a prospective one, uh, can or a prospective uh, cohort collection can uh, give you what is happening in the real world. And uh, what I will spend most of my time talking about are prospective cohort trials. Uh, the Vermont Oxford Network, uh, uh, which really uh, is uh, centered in uh, uh, the state of Vermont, which is just north of uh, where uh, uh, I live in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, uh, was started by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gerald Lucy. Dr. Uh, Lucy uh, uh, was one of the pioneer neonatologists uh, in North America and the editor of pediatrics for uh, 35 years. Uh, and what he envisioned was a, a prospective data collection by clinical staff across the whole of North America and eventually, uh, hopefully, uh, internationally. Uh, currently, there are over 1,200 centers in the Vermont Oxford Network. Uh, they all uh, collect data prospectively with a uh, manual of operations. And in the United States, uh, we've been able uh, to uh, prospectively collect uh, uh, outcome data on uh, over 90% of all uh, very low birth weight neonates born in the U.S., which is approximately 100,000 neonates per year. And uh, since 2003, uh, uh, we at Boston Children's Hospital have been working with uh, Jeff Horbar and Roger Saul, who are uh, senior uh, uh, members of the Vermont Oxford Network, uh, and currently, I also work with Baron Modi, who is uh, one of my uh, junior colleagues, and Erica Edwards and Kate Morrow, who are the Vermont Oxford uh, uh, statisticians. And all of the data are uh, uh, collated and checked for accuracy uh, in Vermont, and uh, uh, that forms the basis uh, for prospective data collection. Uh, we added surgical fields uh, uh, to this data collection. Uh, uh, around 2000 and uh, have been uh, uh, looking at the results uh, since. So for very low birth weight uh, uh, neonates, this uh, cohort uh, is really almost population-based. We, uh, we uh, uh, basically get uh, 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 all of the very low birth weight neonates in the United States. There's also a much larger big babies database uh, for uh, uh, children over 2,500 grams, uh, uh, but despite its size in terms of the proportion of uh, neonates born in the United States, it's still just a representative sample. It's not a population base. And all neonates uh, within the Vermont Oxford uh, network are followed to discharge home uh, or uh, one year in hospital and uh, they are deemed to have survived if they uh, are discharged home or if they uh, uh, stay in hospital for greater than one year. Uh, we also have a, a second data collection, sorry, a third data collection, where we uh, take a look at uh, extremely low birth weight neonates and they're evaluated 18 to 24 months for neurologic and other uh, outcomes. So let's uh, move to necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, I've been interested in necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, obviously because I'm a pediatric surgeon and it's the most common gastrointestinal emergency in the neonate, but also it happens to be uh, the most common progenitor of short bowel syndrome. And uh, if we take a look at the uh, X-ray to the left, you can see sort of some speckling on the right side of the abdomen, the baby's distended, uh, and at that point, we may uh, uh, say that they have a, a possible neck or a neck watch. Uh, we watch them the next day. We see this funny shadow, which, of course, is a football sign. And we see uh, uh, that that is actually free air. And uh, then for sure, we know that uh, we have uh, uh, had a neck uh, uh, episode and it has perforated.
One thing about necrotizing enterocolitis that's very important, and this is something that uh, we wrote in the Journal of American College of Surgeons a while ago, is that necrotizing enterocolitis is actually an umbrella diagnosis for a group of similarly presenting largely idiopathic disease processes that affect the neonatal intestine. So there are specific subsets of NEC that need to be considered uh, separately. The definition for necrotizing enterocolitis in the Vermont-Oxford uh, uh, realm uh, uh, relies on both clinical and radiologic criteria, uh, as well as findings at laparotomy and postmortem, which supersede any of the clinical and radiologic uh, findings. So you have to have one or more of the following, uh, bilious gastric uh, aspirate, emesis, abdominal distension, occult uh, or gross fecal blood without the evidence of anal fissures. Plus, you have to have one or more of the following imaging uh, findings, uh, which can be uh, either by uh, uh, film or uh, ultrasound. There are pneumatosis intestinalis, portal venous gas, uh, or pneumoperitoneum. And uh, uh, I personally don't find the bell classification uh, uh, very useful, but I do find uh, uh, definitions such as the, this, which are reproducible, uh, quite useful. So how do we uh, uh, disambiguate neck and sip? And uh, uh, here we have a patient with obvious free air. You can see the liver uh, outlined by the free air. And is this neck or is it sip? Uh, for the purposes of this, uh, obviously at laparotomy, we can tell. Uh, uh, this at laparotomy, we can define definitively as necrotizing enterocolitis. You can see a segment of affected bowel uh, in the uh, uh, mid-small bowel. Uh, the treatment here would be a, uh, usually an end stoma temporarily uh, and resection of that with uh, 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 ultimate uh, reanastomosis while the uh, child is in hospital. But then there's another disease. Um, necrotizing enterocolitis was first described in the 1960s in New York City as uh, premature neonates uh, uh, started to survive. Uh, spontaneous intestinal perforation was first described in 1981. And it was initially described as a variant of NEC. Now it's often considered a separate disease process. Surgically defined, it uh, has to involve less than two centimeters of small bowel. It usually, but not always, affects the terminal ileum. It can affect other portions of the small bowel. By the Vermont-Oxford uh, uh, definition, uh, SIP can only be uh, 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 defined at laparotomy. So when we talk about SIP, it's laparotomy confirmed SIP, so it's true SIP. Uh, we have incorporated recently a, or developed a, um, a set of criteria quite analogous to the NET criteria with clinical and uh, diagnostic imaging uh, uh, correlates for suspected SIP. However, this has not been rolled out to the uh, network as a whole. So when I talk about SIP, uh, it will be uh, a laparotomy confirmed SIP. So obviously, if uh, uh, when we look at neck subsets, the most common neck subset is actually what we find in very low birth weight uh, neonates. And uh, uh, as I stated, a subset of that uh, will include SIP. There's another common type of uh, uh, bowel uh, ischemia where there is uh, a gastroschisis associated pneumatosis with ischemic bowel. We sometimes call that necrotizing enterocolitis. Of course, it's a completely different disease, but we will talk about that and give you data regarding that. And then there's uh, stuff that we call big baby necrotizing enterocolitis, which truly is ischemic bowel. It's not uh, uh, the same disease as uh, uh, we see in very low birth weight neonates, and it's often associated with serious cardiac abnormalities, and we'll present some data regarding that. So the first question we asked uh, 
uh, in our collaboration is what is the incidence of mortality of necrotizing enterocolitis expressed by birth weight categories? It seemed to us that that would be very important. And whenever we look at outcomes in the Vermont Oxford network where we have huge data sets, it turns out that birth weight is always a little better predictor of uh, outcome than estimated gestational age, although the two overlap considerably. Um, and that's probably because estimated gestational age is estimated, uh, while birth weight is a hard data point. Of course, with low birth weights, there is an element of IUGR that can uh, creep in, but surprisingly, uh, uh, that uh, 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 does not affect uh, uh, the data analysis uh, considerably. So, what is the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis? And uh, often there's a single number that's uh, quoted, uh, but uh, that is not what should be done. Uh, incidence really needs to be uh, determined according to birth weight. And if you're comparing center to center, uh, you have to account for how many uh, uh, neonates you have in each of these groups. And it's quite remarkable that the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis seems to decrease by 3% for every 250 gram increment in birth weight. So uh, we go from 12 to 9 to 6 to 3%. Uh, and this is based on a, uh, a prospective cohort analysis of uh, nearly 72,000 very low birth weight neonates. So how about mortality? Well, we often think of mortality of, of uh, uh, um, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis as a disease of uh, babies of 1,000 to 1,500 grams. Uh, but, but that's not a, a exactly true. In fact, the highest incidence is in the very low, lowest birth weight. And the very highest mortality uh, is in the very lowest birth weight. And the orange bars here uh, show you the mortality for necrotizing enterocolitis for each birth weight category. Uh, and it decreases, as you might uh, imagine, with increased birth weight. However, if you look at the odds ratio or uh, signal over noise ratio, uh, you can see that where we uh, have a spectacular difference uh, of uh, survival it, it, when we compare uh, neonates who do and do not have necrotizing enterocolitis is really in the uh, somewhat higher birth weights. And of course, those are the ones that stick in our mind. But the uh, uh, moral of the story is that uh, actually the very highest incidence and the very highest mortality is in the lowest birth weight range. So here are some potentially helpful numbers for you regarding the incidence of mortality of neck. It's highly predicted by birth weight. Uh, the incidence goes 12 to 9 to 6 to 3 uh, percent for each 250 gram increment over 500 grams. Uh, the mortality decreases uh, to 40, 30, 20, and 15 percent. And this, of course, is the Vermont Oxford definition. So they're at this, uh, they're considered to have survived if they are discharged home uh, or if they have spent a year in the hospital. So let's ask a different question. Let's ask what is the mortality of neonatal spontaneous intestinal perforation? And this was a subsequent study we did. And uh, as I told you, we defined uh, spontaneous intestinal perforation in necrotizing enterocolitis and laparotomy. And uh, uh, um, uh, so we're really comparing the uh, uh, mortality of uh, operatively proven SIP versus operatively proven uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, SIP is quite different than uh, Patients who have SIP are, are quite different than those uh, equivalent uh, uh, premature neonates who do not have SIP. Uh, they have uh, uh, greatly increased uh, utilization of steroids for uh, uh, lung disease, uh, higher incidence of patent ductus arteriosus, higher incidence of endomethacin administration, 
higher incidence of PDA ligation, and a combined higher incidence of indomethacin and steroids. So here is the mortality of SIP, and these are uh, uh, this cohort of 800 neonates. Uh, all were laparotic proven SIP. And you can see that there's sort of a same general trend as uh, with uh, 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 necrotizing enterocolitis overall. However, there uh, uh, does seem to be a, uh, a plateauing in uh, mortality uh, 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 towards the end of the curve. Uh, and again, the uh, very smallest neonates, uh, not surprisingly, have the very highest uh, 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 mortality. Let's compare the mortality of SIP to necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 here we have two large uh, uh, cohorts that we have uh, studied. And what you can see is that uh, uh, the odds ratio uh, for SIP is much lower in terms of mortality than for surgical neck. Uh, and that holds for each birth weight uh, category. Uh, the uh, um, interesting thing is that uh, uh, SIP is still uh, uh, a disease that's uh, highly associated with uh, mortality and uh, much more than uh, we uh, thought before we uh, did this study. In fact, the overall all mortality for laparotomy confirmed SIP and very low birth weight neonates is 19%. So uh, although we tend to uh, give a very positive uh, 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 report to patients if we uh, find SIP, uh, that probably uh, is incorrect and we should be quite cautious uh, about uh, uh, how these neonates are going to do. Uh, the mortality of SIP is significantly greater than baseline. Uh, that is uh, 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 true. And uh, the mortality of SIP is significantly less than that for surgical neck. Uh, so it certainly does uh, behave like a different, but a very serious disease. We have a current study ongoing that's looking at the uh, uh, um, morbidity of SIP and uh, quite surprisingly, the uh, lengths of stay for SIP are extremely long and quite in line with those of uh, babies who've had necrotizing enterocolitis. So there's a controversy in uh, surgery about how we treat necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, uh, I grew up in Canada and trained at the University of Toronto. And that is uh, where uh, uh, the use of perineal drains was popularized. It was first started in a city uh, quite close to Toronto called uh, Hamilton. And the surgeons there, uh, there were only two surgeons in the whole city. And uh, in order to stabilize babies, they put in uh, a drain uh, when the baby came very distended and manifested with free air. Uh, before transport, they would put in a drain uh, try to improve uh, uh, the compartment syndrome physiology within the abdomen and then transfer the baby. And then this uh, technique was taken over in a more formal way at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, and I was uh, uh, a chief resident there. And uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, pediatric surgeons there, the late Ziggy Ein, uh, popularized this as a technique for uh, treating uh, uh, babies under a thousand grams who manifested with uh, a suspected neck. Uh, at that time, the diagnosis of SIP was not uh, uh, widely accepted. And over time, uh, this technique has been generalized to sometimes uh, uh, become uh, the uh, only treatment and also uh, the use of uh, drains has been broadened to babies over 1,000 uh, grams in weight. Uh, the interesting thing that came out of our experience at uh, uh, the Hospital for Sick Children is that a subset of babies uh, survived and did well with only drainage. 
So they manifest with a distended abdomen. We put in a drain and then they self seal uh, and uh, uh, no further operation uh, uh, was needed. And of course, that's something quite unique to babies that would certainly not occur in uh, uh, older children and adults. So the Cochrane review uh, of this, uh, which I, for which I was an external reviewer, at the end, when it looked at uh, the data regarding laparotomy and primary peritoneal drains, and there are two randomized control trials, both unfortunately are too small uh, to give definitive data. And in fact, the uh, authors of the two studies with almost identical data draw totally different conclusions. And the way to look at this debate uh, is the following. The evidence from two randomized controlled trials suggests no significant benefits or harms of perineal drainage over laparotomy. However, due to the very small sample size, clinically significant differences may have been easily missed. No firm recommendations can be made for clinicians. And that statement still holds true. One of the related questions, uh, and uh, we were just one of the uh, uh, centers in a multi-institutional study uh, looking at if there were any clinical progression predictors. So could we predict a child who had su suspected neck? Was there something in their uh, history or physical exam that would lead us to uh, uh, believe that they would uh, require later surgery or die from necrotizing enterocolitis. And to save you reading the article, I can tell you there were no really clinically useful uh, parameters. So unfortunately, for babies that you suspect with NAC, you have to follow clinically and see which direction they're going. And uh, any baby with suspected NAC, unfortunately, could, can evolve surgical NAC. And uh, uh, the uh, smaller they are, the more likely that they are going to run into complications. So the next question we asked was the mor mortality of surgical uh, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis in very low birth weight neonates. And again, we used our prospective cohort to design. Uh, we uh, already had the data and uh, then we uh, delved into uh, 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 trying to uh, 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 figure it out statistically Uh, we restricted this study to the United States, and we have done that with the vast majority of our studies, and that's not because of any uh, uh, wish to just know about the United States, but uh, we do know uh, how the healthcare system works in the U.S., and it's uh, easier for us to uh, 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 draw conclusions than in other settings where we uh, are less uh, uh, acquainted with exact workings of the healthcare system. So we wanted to assess the utilization and associated mortality of laparotomy and primary peritoneal drains. Uh, we studied 215,000 very low birth weight neonates. Uh, to show you the high fidelity of the data collection, there were only 40 out of those 215,000 that had unknown neck status. Uh, you can see that there were about 17,000 neck neonates included in this, these studies. About half were medical, half were surgical, and a large proportion received laparotomy, as well as a large proportion that received primary peritoneal drainage, and then uh, a, a good proportion of the primary peritoneal drain group uh, also received the laparotomy later. So that's sort of the classic treatment pathway for uh, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Overall, 9% uh, of very low birth weight neonates were diagnosed with NEC. Uh, half of those had surgical NEC. So if you have uh, uh, the Vermont Oxford definition of uh, NEC, then it's a 50-50 chance whether you will uh, uh, require surgery or not. Interestingly, 69% uh, of uh, surgical neonates had a primary laparotomy rather than primary peritoneal drainage. And that just shows that uh, uh, at the time of this study, and it has changed somewhat, 
uh, surgeons and neonatologists were not in equipoise. Uh, certainly there was a preference to do laparotomies and uh, uh, one of the advantages of laparotomies, you can actually take a look at the bowel and determine uh, what the uh, 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 likelihood of uh, uh, the out, you know, final outcome is going to be. If they've lost a huge amount of uh, small intestine, you can tell the patient's families that there are going to be problems later. While in, uh, 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 if it is only a small segment, then you can say it's SIP, and then you know you, the mortality is going to be uh, uh, somewhere in the realm of uh, 19%, and uh, the likelihood for regaining bowel function is very good. So, uh, uh, and then as we mentioned, about 46% of the primary peritoneal drain group also had a subsequent laparotomy. So uh, there was a proportion of uh, patients that was only treated with primary peritoneal drain. If we take a look at the mortality of surgical versus medical MAC by birth weight, you can see a very different curve. And if you take a look at the black bars, which are the surgical MAC, you can see that there's a plateau in mortality. So regardless of how big the baby is, the mortality for a very low birth weight neonate who has necrotizing enterocolitis never falls below 30%. So it asymptotes at 30%. While with medical MAC, as you increase in uh, uh, birth weight, there is a continual fall in uh, 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 mortality. And uh, also you can see that there is a, a, a significantly higher mortality with surgical neck than medical neck. Um, so the mortality for surgical neck overall is 35%, for medical neck, 21%. Um, surgical neck mortality plateaus at 30%, regardless of uh, uh, weight for very low birth weight neonates. When we looked at these uh, using our standard uh, uh, multivariable logistic regression analysis, the three independent predictors of survival were birth weight, lower birth weight, lower survival, surgical neck. If you have surgical neck, you obviously have worse survival. And primary peritoneal drains was a significant independent predictor of mortality. And the question one has to ask, is it because it was applied to a sicker cohort or uh, uh, a, are primary peritoneal drains an inferior treatment? And uh, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, it, the answer is uh, 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 more uh, the former and uh, uh, it's uh, more complex than first appears. So if we take a look at the mortality of laparotomy versus primary peritoneal drain with laparotomy, which is sort of the classic way primary peritoneal drains uh, uh, were uh, uh, used and uh, how they were first used, the mortality is really equivalent. It's 31 versus 34%. How about the primary peritoneal drain alone group? Well, that was associated with significantly higher mortality, 50%. However, it turns out it was a more ill cohort. Although we risk stratify all our uh, babies uh, 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 using a uh, pretty well-established algorithm. There are certain things that even with that, uh, we can't quite risk stratify for. For instance, the PPD alone group had more uh, uh, episodes of arrest in uh, during resuscitation post-delivery, and uh, there were many other subtle signs that they were more ill. The story is even more complex because 27% of neonates who received primary peritoneal drain survived and needed no other surgery. So these babies by definition had to have had SIP or minimal neck because uh, they resealed. So primary peritoneal drains as they're applied currently in North America uh, are actually a dichotomous group. They're either applied to very, very sick neonates where taking them to the OR and laparotomy is not feasible. They may be on an oscillatory ventilator or they're applied to very well babies who 
just require a drain and then they self seal. So it's a dichotomous cohort. And uh, 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 really uh, these data uh, uh, support that uh, uh, probably laparotomy or primary peritoneal drains with laparotomy are equivalent therapies uh, and primary peritoneal drains is in, are, are used for either uh, salvage attempts or in very well babies. We'll come back to that uh, with a later study. So the next question we want to ask is, what is the effect of NICU surgical center type and transfers on the mortality of surgical neck? How could we improve our systems? And are there variant survivals? So this was a three-year cohort study. We looked at uh, around 4,330 neonates with surgical neck. In the Vermont-Oxford uh, network, we divide centers into three types. Uh, there are A centers which have neonatal intensive care units with ventilatory capacity, but no pediatric surgeon, no pediatric anesthesiologist on staff at the hospital. Uh, so they would have to come in on an emergency basis if they were going to come in. Then type B centers, which have a, uh, a well-developed uh, neonatal intensive care unit with good ventilatory capacity, a pediatric surgeon, surgeon uh, on staff, and a pediatric anesthesiologist on staff. And then type C centers, which have everything that a type B center is, plus the capacity to do uh, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass on neonates. And of course, it's not that we do cardiopulmonary bypass on neonates with neck very often, but it just is not a proxy for a more sophisticated center. So if we take a look at the mortality of inborn patients, in type B and C centers, you can see that the mortality in type B centers is actually higher than in type C uh, centers. So the more sophisticated the center, the better the outcomes with necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, this is not uh, what we have found, for instance, with gastroschisis. And then how about not transferred versus transferred? So if you transfer a patient with necrotizing enterocolitis from a B center to a C center, there's actually mm -hmm. a improvement in survival. Mm -hmm. So necrotizing enterocolitis is definitely a, a disease that uh, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the, uh, um, uh, in the United States uh, uh, should be transferred to a, a highly experienced uh, center. Mm -hmm. So the next question we wanted to ask uh, relating to the incidence of mortality of medical and surgical neck and very low birth weight neonates is to see what's happening over time because there have been multiple changes in how uh, we manage uh, these uh, neonates. And uh, again, this is a, a U.S. study, uh, 890 reporting centers uh, was recently published. And the first thing we uh, looked at was, well, what has been the trend in median birth weight of uh, very low birth weight neonates who have medical neck? And as you can see, there is a tendency to a decreased uh, birth weight, uh, which would, you know, based on our previous data, uh, uh, indicate that we should have a higher incidence of medical neck over time. And then when we look at surgical neck, we find the same trend, a uh, tendency toward decreased median birth weight. And again, we would think that we would have a higher incidence of surgical neck and a higher mortality. The other interesting thing, and you know, I was telling you before that primary peritoneal drains were used less than uh, initial laparotomy. But over the uh, uh, recent years, the two have actually equilibrated. So the primary peritoneal drains as an initial treatment strategy is uh, used about equivalently to uh, uh, laparotomy. Well, to our surprise, uh, when we look at year-over-year -year trends, 
the incidence of medical neck actually decreased uh, uh, in very low birth weight neonates from 5.3% to 3%. The incidence of surgical neck also decreased significantly, uh, but to a lesser extent from 34 to 3.1%. And when we uh, uh, looked at comparable centers, so these are uh, 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 centers that we could compare region to region. This, uh, uh, this, these are unpublished data. You can see that regardless of the region of the United States, north, south, central, or west, there was a decrease in neck as incidence. More interestingly, the mortality of medical neck decreased significantly year over year. Uh, uh, from 20.6% to 16.5%. And the mortality of surgical neck was also uh, 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 significantly down by 5% from 36.4% to 31.3%. And this is despite the median birth weight of very low birth weight neonates actually decreasing. So the change over time is even more pronounced than these data would indicate. Uh, so one tempting hypothesis is, gee, you know, maybe we've gotten really good at figuring out who should get primary peritoneal drains, who should get surgery, and maybe that's had an effect. But actually, that's not the story. When we looked at uh, the primary peritoneal drain group and the surgical group for open laparotomies, uh, uh, the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, survival uh, decreased equivalently in both groups. So why did it decrease? Well, unfortunately, cohort studies can't tell you that. You need prospective randomized controlled trials uh, uh, for this to definitively tell you, but uh, there are associations. And uh, uh, the big uh, uh, comment is that these may not be causal. But what we did notice in the Vermont Oxford database is that over time, uh, there was increased documentation of breast milk feeding at discharge, implying a greater utilization of breast milk, breastfeeding and breast milk. And also there has been an increased use of donor milk in the United States. Uh, the use of antenatal steroids, which also has increased during this time was associated uh, with this decline in survival. And another fascinating thing is that we noticed, although the babies were uh, 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 smaller to start with over time, there was an increased weight of discharge implying better overall nutritional therapy of these neonates. So those are the uh, uh, things that uh, uh, we have as possible uh, uh, things to study in a randomized control fashion. And in the Vermont Oxford network, it's important to note that almost all neonatal diseases seem to have decreased mortality over time. And that may be just attributable to improved systems, improved overall ICU care. The one exception is uh, uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So let's ask another important question. Uh, and this is very important to tell parents and also inform ourselves, uh, what are the severe neurodevelopmental disabilities in neonates with medical and surgical neck? And as I told you, we have a cohort of uh, babies that we study at 18 uh, uh, to 24 months uh, uh, adjusted uh, uh, age. Uh, who have had uh, medical or surgical neck. And these are the data and uh, uh, they are uh, quite uh, uh, um, uh, remarkable in that if you have uh, surgical neck uh, at uh, that 18 to 24 month period, if you test them, 38% uh, will have severe neurodevelopmental disability. And by severe neurodevelopmental disability, we're using the classic definition that they can't walk 10 set steps, they have cerebral palsy, uh, uh, cortical blindness, uh, deafness, or uh, they're 
more than two standard deviations away uh, uh, on their uh, Bailey scales. So these are uh, truly significantly impaired neonates. So if a parent wants to know what are the likelihoods uh, of uh, severe neurologic uh, disability, 17% uh, um, uh, for a neonate, uh, a very low birth weight neonate without uh, uh, a neck, 24% if they have a medical neck, 38% if they have uh, a surgical neck. And of course, this is uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, different. Well, what can we do perhaps to improve outcomes? And this is another study uh, where we looked at gross morbidity and extremely low birth weight survival of neck at discharge and two-year follow-up. So at discharge in the United States, 56% of patients with medical neck and 61% of patients with surgical neck were less than the third percentile uh, weight for age. Uh, those without neck are 36%. Um, this certainly is an opportunity for quality improvement where we can improve their uh, weights. And as I told you, when we looked at year over year analysis, that actually has been getting better over time. At two years, all of the groups tend to equalize with uh, respect to their uh, weights. Uh, uh, however, uh, one could argue that uh, during the interval up to two years, there has been an opportunity lost in order to optimize uh, 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 neurocognitive outcome. So let's switch gears a bit. And I told you that there were different types of neck or what we called neck. And uh, let's look at gastroschisis and necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, when we say necrotizing enterocolitis, of course, it is not the same disease as we have in very low birth weight neonates. What I like to call it is gastroschisis associated pneumatosis rather than neck. And it really is an ischemic consequence. Uh, as you can see with uh, gastroschisis, there is a, a, a change in how the uh, bowel is uh, uh, perfused. Uh, uh, and the longer that the intestine is exposed to the uh, uh, amniotic fluid and uh, uh, the uh, uh, urine that the baby uh, places in the amnion, uh, the more edematous and uh, 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 damaged the bowel gets. So the incidence of NAC, or what we call NAC, but it's gastroschisis associated pneumatosis, is 5%. So less than the incidence of NAC in very low birth weight neonates, it's probably not NAC. The mortality of gastroschisis with NAC or what we call NAC, but shouldn't, uh, is uh, 5%. That's much higher than the baseline mortality of gastroschisis, which is uh, 2%. And the uh, uh, length of stay, if you have gastroschisis with ischemic bowel, uh, with pneumatosis, is 84 days, which is much higher than the baseline uh, length of stay with gastroschisis, which is around 37 days. And we published these data in the Journal of Pediatrics. So you can find that for your reference. So how about what we call neck in big babies, which again is better uh, uh, thought of as ischemic bowel. It's not the classic necrotizing enterocolitis of very low birth weight neonates. So here we looked at, uh, again, prospectively 1,700 neonates greater than 2,500 2, grams. Their uh, um, average, uh, uh, their median gestational age was 37 weeks. Uh, their mortality of surgery was needed was 23%, 8% in medical cases. So less, uh, much less than the disease that we see in very low birth weight neonates. Uh, it, the independent predictors of mortality were severe congenital heart defects. So this really is ischemic bowel. Interestingly, another independent predictor of mortality was, were chromosomal defects. Um, and uh, uh, 
but this is a very different disease than uh, uh, what we call necrotizing enterocolitis and very low birth weight DNAs. Now, that's not to say that uh, uh, serious congenital heart disease and neck and very low birth weight neonates is different than neck and very low birth weight neonates. So there's the big baby neck associated with congenital heart disease, which is truly ischemic bowel. But if you look at serious congenital heart disease and very low birth weight neonates, as this study that we uh, did uh, shows, and we excluded neonates with uh, simple ASDs and PDAs, what we found is that the incidence of neck was very similar in pattern to what we showed without congenital heart disease, only the incidence was higher, 13% versus 9% for the whole cohort. The mortality of congenital heart disease and neck in very low birth weight neonates is 55%, which is significantly higher than either alone. When we looked, we wanted to see if there was a particular uh, disease process that was more likely to cause neck. We looked at AV canal and trisomy 21. Uh, uh, sorry, we looked at multiple congenital heart uh, 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 problems. We worked with our cardiologists in the Vermont Oxford Network. And it turns out, unfortunately, that AV canals are the most associated and the only significantly associated uh, entity with the evolution of necrotizing enterocolitis uh, in very low birth weight neonates. AV canal has multiple uh, and different uh, effects depending on how uh, the specifics of the AV canal defect. So unfortunately, it didn't give us much of an insight into the pathogenesis of neck. Uh, it's interesting that trisomy alone, even without an AV canal, increases the incidence of neck in very low birth weight neonates. So uh, in big babies, it's ischemic bowel, in very low birth weight neonates, you have congenital heart disease. You end up just accentuating the natural pattern of uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, which uh, transpires even without congenital heart disease. So one thing that we published recently that's gotten a lot of attention, and this is a caution, this is a single center study, it's just our center, are long-term outcomes of severe surgical necrotizing enterocolitis. And we define severe surgical necrotizing enterocolitis as a residual small bowel length of less than 30 centimeters. And uh, we had 41 of these uh, babies that we've taken care of in our Center for Advanced Intestinal Rehabilitation. The survival long-term has been 68%, including three babies with neck totalis. I think neck totalis, along with the Bell's classification, is a term that needs to be forgotten and not used. Uh, you should just quote how much bowel is left uh, rather than terming it neck totalis. Um, these babies that were followed for eight years, uh, 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 a median follow-up, 32% of them eventually weaned from parental nutrition. 71% had no severe neurologic disability throughout their follow-up. So the huge proviso here is that this is at Boston Children's Hospital, which is probably uh, uh, the most highly resourced children's hospital in the world. And they're not generally applicable, these data, but it does show you that uh, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis children do have a uh, tremendous capacity for recovering uh, their intestinal function uh, over time. At least if you can provide maximal support, and that includes home parental nutrition, et cetera. So currently, uh, what we're uh, trying to determine is neurodevelopmental disability and home health care needs in the extremely low birth weight survivors of surgical neck. And we're looking at those who had primary peritoneal drains versus uh, 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 open laparotomy. Uh, there's a, a prejudice that perhaps uh, the primary peritoneal drain uh, uh, group has 
uh, more severe neurologic disabilities than uh, those uh, in whom the intestine has had a resection. Uh, um, uh, we are, this paper is in a, a review currently. It was presented as an abstract at the American Pediatric Surgical Association in 2020. And I can tell you categorically that there does not seem to be any difference in neurologic uh, disability. Uh, another current study is we're looking at neurodevelopmental outcomes of extremely low birth weight neonates uh, who have neck and IVH, which is an important thing to know. And uh, um, uh, we're presenting this as an abstract in 2021. There's some very interesting data uh, here, but unfortunately, until it's presented, I'm unable to share it with you. But uh, if you see this uh, as an article from Vermont Oxford, uh, uh, I would urge you to read it. So in summary, uh, I think that large, ideally population-based prospective cohort data collections are extremely helpful in understanding necrotizing enterocolitis and its related diseases. And I think that scientific collaboration between neonatologists and pediatric surgeons is uh, very important. And uh, if we have time, I'd love to answer your questions. Thank you, sir, for this nice and beneficial lecture. Uh, we just, uh, if your time uh, met, we have some few questions for uh, you, sure. sir. Uh, the, first of, the first of all, uh, we all know that there is certain indication for inter surgical interference uh, for cases of necrotizing enterocolitis, such as air in the portal vein and sinal obstruction, air under the frame. But still, there is an indication which is failure of medical treatment. How you, sir, define failure of medical treatment in these cases? So that's a, a, a difficult uh, question to answer. Uh, and it depends on what maximal medical management uh, uh, can be afforded to the baby. Uh, here, uh, we'll uh, look at the hemodynamic stability of the baby. Uh, if the baby is hemodynamically stable, uh, then we will tend to continue conservative or expectant. It's not really conservative. It's expectant management where we'll regularly monitor the baby. Uh, uh, free air uh, uh, definitely warrants uh, uh, surgical intervention. Portal venous gas does not warrant surgical intervention, but it is a warning sign uh, that uh, 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 First of all, one definitely has pneumatosis because uh, that's how the air is getting into the portal system. It's going uh, 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 across the bowel into the portal uh, circulation. Uh, so this is a severe uh, episode of neck. And uh, uh, when you see that, you certainly do not have SIP, you have neck. Uh, so uh, um, uh, we would just watch that baby carefully. If they became hemodynamically uh, uh, unstable, we were unable to control that uh, with uh, pressors, then we would go in. Uh, our prejudice is that, uh, unfortunately, early uh, intervention uh, can uh, result in unnecessary bowel loss. Uh, when you go in, everything is quite scarred, and uh, we can actually cause more harm than good. And uh, one thing that we worry about as pediatric surgeons is actually uh, injuring the liver. Uh, the liver in premature neonates is extremely fragile, and even uh, uh, scraping it can cause massive hemorrhage. So uh, if we can avoid going in uh, to the abdomen, we will, uh, if there's free air or if the baby is hemodynamically unstable uh, uh, and we're having difficulty maintaining uh, uh, the baby, then we will do so. I think with new hepatoprotective uh, 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 parental nutrition, the incidence of liver disease and long-term PN has really uh, uh, dropped to uh, uh, almost zero. And uh, you can either uh, uh, do it using uh, any non-soy-based uh, uh, formula. Uh, 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 Omegavin uh, is a fish oil-based formula, and that will is not associated with intestinal failure associated uh, uh, liver disease, but uh, it uh, uh, 
uh, is uh, given only at one to two grams per kilo per day. So it may be hard to meet caloric requirements in the neonate. You have to run fairly high GIRs. Uh, the um, use of SMOF uh, does ameliorate it. Uh, also, uh, restricting lipids also does uh, uh, help with uh, uh, um, uh, intestinal failure associated with liver disease. So uh, our tendency is to uh, uh, try to preserve as much small bowel as possible. Ultimately, that's what's going to make the patient's uh, uh, life better. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, if we have a child with very bad general condition and we had to put a tube drain because he is not fit for surgery, is this the only measure we can do for him? Or if he's improved, we are going to operate? So it depends. Uh, and if they have minimal neck or SIP, putting in the drain uh, uh, can be definitive therapy. And uh, uh, what uh, we would do is uh, usually we put in the drain in the uh, uh, left lower quadrant. Some surgeons will put in a drain in the left and right lower quadrant. The key is to stay away from the liver. You don't want to uh, damage it as you're putting in the drain. It can be done under local at bedside. The, uh, uh, then we see what happens. Uh, usually, uh, even in the sickest of infants, our studies would indicate that you improve urine output and uh, um, uh, uh, decrease uh, peak inspiratory pressures, but uh, there's no definitive proof that you've actually affected survival uh, in the sickest neonates. Uh, we hope that we do. Uh, then we would see what happens. If the baby is uh, uh, doing very well, stabilizes, we would just wait and see what happens with the drains. Uh, once the uh, drains uh, uh, stop draining succus, uh, um, then we would slowly uh, uh, withdraw them. In practice, as you know, the uh, baby's abdominal wall is quite thin. So even if one tries to slowly withdraw the drain, it ends up just falling out in the next day or two uh, once the suture is uh, 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 removed. So uh, if the baby then starts having bowel movements, then that's the definitive therapy, then we would feed. We wouldn't even study uh, uh, using contrast studies. We try to feed. If the, feed. if the baby can feed, no further therapy. If the baby can't feed, then we would do an upper GI with small bowel fall through, see if there's any residual stricture and take care of it. Putting in the drain and uh, the child does not uh, reestablish uh, 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 bowel continuity and uh, there are no bowel movements, uh, then we would do a laparotomy. If the baby puts a drain and there is no uh, improvement uh, uh, over time, then there is an argument for a, a salvage laparotomy uh, uh, for a, a, a control of uh, a sepsis. And then we would do that. That is actually the classic treatment algorithm. Uh, the way drains were originally used was to put in the drain and then stabilize the baby and then go to the operating room. Uh, uh, but it's been broadened. And as I said, in uh, uh, about 27% of the neonates uh, is put in the drain and they self-seal and we need no other operation. Okay, thank you. The, uh, the next question is if we have the neck cutalis, if we have major NEC affection of the gastrointestinal tract, what to do then? If you, if you have a diagnosis of neck? Neck totalis, uh, major oh, neck NEC. So first of all, yeah. you should never use neck totalis. Because what's neck totalis to me is different than neck totalis to someone else. And uh, as I showed you, three, three patients that we had in our cohort who had nectotalis and were uh, I mean, why, why you spread the uh, any Widespread necrotizing enterocolitis with less than 30 centimeters of small bowel. How about that? We have that? extensive NEC. <laughs> we have extensive NEC when we operate. Yes. Excellent. All right. So, you know, in all seriousness, it depends on the center where you work and what quality of life this child is going to have. And it's something that a careful discussion has to occur between the surgeon, neonatologist, and the patient. 
uh, patient's family uh, regarding that. Now, where I work, uh, we are incredibly aggressive with these babies. And that's because we have home parental nutrition. We have uh, a world-class intestinal failure program. And uh, we know that centimeter per centimeter, babies with necrotizing enterocolitis actually have the very best outcomes for intestinal rehabilitation. And we also do our own in-house intestinal transplants. So it's a totally different picture here than if I were working in a center where there was no home PN uh, availability. If we look at now uh, what the 50th percentile likelihood is from weaning from parental nutrition in terms of small bowel amount, it's 25 centimeters in, in most intestinal rehabilitation centers. So if you have less than 25 centimeters, then that child has a very high chance of being on parental nutrition for uh, uh, their life. So you have to judge that and whatever the capacities are. Then the other thing is, do they have IVH, severe IVH? Uh, what is their neurologic outcome going to be? How will the family cope with that? Uh, my experience is that over time, uh, babies who, uh, who become children and then young adults and adults with necrotizing enterocolitis, they actually can be quite functional human beings. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so, but they do need to know the data. And the data from the Vermont Oxford Network would indicate if you have surgical neck, regardless of how uh, much intestine is affected, at two years, you're going to have a 38% chance of a severe neurodevelopmental a disability. So again, those are things that need to be discussed with the family. Uh, questions, uh, please, Professor Tom. Uh, is there a difference, in your opinion, between the mortality between uh, spontaneous intestinal perforation and, and neck is due to delayed decision to by the uh, neonatologist and the surgeon to uh, open the, the NEC, or uh, whether the, the neonatalizing is associated with more inflammatory markers or more skin of the bowel, so the mortality is more? What is your opinion on that? So my opinion based on the data, since you know we've, we've had this uh, very interesting uh, uh, shift in uh, treatment uh, in the United States where now about 50% of uh, babies with suspected neck uh, get drains and 50% get initial laparotomy. If one surmised that it was very important to remove uh, 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 the dead intestine uh, and uh, uh, that would improve outcomes, uh, that has not borne out either in survival analyses nor in our analyses of neurodevelopmental uh, outcomes at two years. So my guess would be that the real problem is the inflammatory uh, reaction uh, and sepsis that occurs uh, regardless of whether you remove or do not remove that uh, intestine. Okay, so, uh, uh, also I, I want to ask, uh, sometimes we use the thrombocytopenia uh, and the persistent metabolic acidosis as a marker for us as a medical uh, consultant uh, that is this worsening the conditions. Is This is for your opinion also? Yeah, the platelets are being trapped uh, uh, in the microcirculation of the uh, uh, um, affected bowel. Uh, so that does occur, and of course you get sepsis, which will drop the platelets potentially further in some individuals. Uh, but it's really just the platelet trapping that is the that. So it does tell you that uh, you either have uh, a lot of bowel that's affected or a substantive amount of bowel that's affected, and you may have uncontrolled sepsis. So yes, I think platelet count is a reasonable thing to look at. 
and uh, uh, acidosis is a general uh, uh, consequence of uh, uh, the uh, uh, patient's uh, illness and uh, sepsis, and it's uh, partly because you have increased uh, 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 lactate from uh, sepsis and partly because you have uh, renal dysfunction. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think that's another valid uh, parameter. Would I use that in isolation if the child's ventilatory status was improving, the belly was getting better? No, but it's definitely part of the picture. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, just tell me if I'm right. Uh, if we are going to explore a case of a spontaneous perforation, we are going to do resection and osmosis. But if we are going to explore a case of neck, it's better to do diversion. So the, the answer is a nuanced one. So neck can, uh, by definition, we say that if uh, the intestine is involved less than two centimeters, it's spontaneous intestinal perforation. If it's more, it can be uh, neck. But if it's minimal neck and the small bowel, uh, there are series of it in a stable baby, you can excise it and reanastomose it. The most elegant treatment for SIP, if you know a priori at SIP, is just to put in a peritoneal drain. But unfortunately, it's very hard to know uh, exactly who has SIP. And we've been doing recent analyses where, you know, SIP tends to be a disease of. Uh, slightly smaller neonates rather than neck, but actually when you look at the bell-shaped curve of the incidence of neck and SIP, they're nearly superimposable. So you can't use that. So that's why I think our uh, um, latest effort in trying to see how accurate suspected SIP is as a diagnosis will be very helpful in determining that. Because ideally with SIP, you'd like to put in a drain and avoid any surgery. So you put in the drain under local, avoid general anesthesia, and the patient would reseal and never require another operation. That's the simplest algorithm. With NEC, um, you know, we have no data uh, that would uh, push you to uh, uh, whether you should just put in a drain, then eventually go back and uh, resect the bowel versus resect the bowel. There is a, uh, a general tendency to, in a sort of a relatively stable baby who is not recovering to go and explore because all of us want to know what's inside. You know, if you don't open the box, you don't know what's inside, so you can't give an accurate estimate of the prognosis. I can't tell you, gee, we have, you know, uh, 80 centimeters of small bowel left. Don't worry, this child's going to do well, unless I explore it. So those are uh, all the nuanced questions. But uh, there are no data that would uh, uh, favor one uh, uh, line of therapy over another. It's uh, uh, what I find in medicine after you know, 40 years is that uh, the more the argument, the less the data, right? The less clear the data are. So when people are really vehemently arguing about something, it's often because there's no clear answer. So, sir, if we have uh, a baby with a very good general condition, but he got air under the frame, you advise to put a tube drain and wait and see? Uh, yeah, I, I think either way. Uh, I think you'll have very good results either way, but uh, just realize that uh, even in a baby like that, the mortality uh, uh, is going to be around 19%. So uh, you have to tell the parents it's a very serious problem. Uh, we can fix it. Uh, you could put in a drain. Uh, the more sophisticated your Pediatric anesthesia, uh, the more sophisticated the center, uh, the better the pediatric surgeon, the more you might say, all right, we can open it, find out exactly what's going on and fix it. Uh, it the less uh, confident you are in any of those, uh, putting in a drain would certainly not harm the patient and may 
uh, allow them to avoid an operation. So depending on the center you're in uh, would determine your treatment algorithm. So what we find in uh, the United States is that, for instance, in uh, uh, general hospitals uh, where a child is uh, uh, born and has a perforation but is relatively stable, there's a tremendously higher incidence of utilization of drains because they don't have sophisticated pediatric uh, anesthesia. And then that baby would be transferred to a higher center. It does not seem to uh, uh, decrease survival. In fact, it seems to increase survival, that algorithm. Uh, the last question for me, uh, in your opinion, sir, uh, do you prefer early feeding in case of NEC or delayed feeding, late feeding? So I think as soon as you have bowel function, uh, uh, then, uh, and you've completed your antibiotic course, then uh, increasing feeding slowly is uh, useful. We usually go up uh, uh, 10 cc's per kilo uh, as we go up. Uh, that allows equivalent amounts of food to increase and allows us to uh, uh, see how the baby is doing. Um, any, about 10% of these babies who have NAC will evolve strictures and uh, they usually evolve, you know, uh, a month or two or three after uh, uh, the initial event. And what you'll notice is that baby will be relatively well, but start to get more and more distended. And uh, uh, then when you study them, you'll see a clear caliber mismatch and then that requires def definitely surgery. Our goal is to try to get these babies in bowel continuity at their initial hospitalization. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, uh, the bottom line is that uh, uh, there are different types of neck that we call neck. We probably should not call the pneumatosis of uh, big babies with cardiac uh, anomalies and uh, babies with gastroschisis neck. That's a different disease. The true neck is the disease of very low birth weight neonates that we discussed. And as of now, uh, the treatment uh, algorithm of either using a drain followed by laparotomy uh, uh, or just drain alone if the baby gets better versus laparotomy, there are no data to support one or over the other. Thank you very much. It's been a total pleasure. Thank you very much for your uh, share share uh, with us uh, your talk and uh, we are very uh, grateful for uh, sharing with us in our uh, neonatal uh, conference in Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We hope to bye see bye. you again uh, live. Bye-bye. Hope to bye. see you. Take care.